All right, welcome everyone back to another virtual shadowing session with Hearts for Health. Um, today, this Monday, we're joined by Sandra. She's a sonographer um, with nearly 30 years of experience. This is gonna be our first session over, well, we had a couple sessions over ob in general, um, but this is gonna be our first to do with specifically sonography. So we're pretty excited about it. It's not a field that we would hear usually with shadowing. So um, it's gonna be a pretty unique experience. A few reminders for anyone listening, particularly if you've not yet joined us for um, a past session, past shadowing session. At the end of each of these sessions, we have a QA. and a um, So with whatever time that we have remaining after our speaker's presentation today and for the other sessions too, um, we will go through questions uh, that are written in the chat box. So if you do have any questions for Sandra, please write them in the chat and we will go through them in the order that we receive. Um, that will be at the very end of today's session. Also, if you want to stay updated with future shadowing sessions, you can do that through two ways. Either follow us on Instagram where we post our flyers for each of these sessions a few days ahead, um, at least, um, so that you get a heads up over this is going to be the speaker for that Monday or Thursday, um, which are the two days that we have in the week for shadowing sessions. Another way to do that also is through our listserv. So we do the same thing on our listserv just over email. Weekly on Tuesdays, we include the upcoming two sessions um, over that next week. Um, and to join our listserv, either you can join us by emailing us at shadowing.h, the number four, h at gmail.com and ask to be added to the listserv. Just be sure that you include your preferred email, which we recommend to be a personal email and your name. Um, or you can go ahead and log on to or click on to our website at the very bottom of each of those pages, any of them, you can um, find our subscription form on the left-hand side and fill out that subscription form, click submit, and you'll be good to go. Um, you'll be added on. If you have any questions for us outside of that, feel free to reach out. We do have a few other programs outside of virtual shadowing. So if you happen to be curious about those, we're always happy to take any questions over email. Uh, but with that said, Sandra, feel free to take it away. All right, thank you. Um, uh, hi everybody, I'm Sandra Mink. Um, I've been a registered diagnostic medical sonographer for 30 years. Uh, before we launch into all of this, I just wanna say thank you, Michael, and Hearts to Health for having me uh, tonight. I'm happy to be here and hopefully you find the information useful. I'm gonna try to keep this to 45 minutes or less maybe so you all have time to ask uh, questions. But uh, I'll go on and start with my first slide here. Um, this is my email address, ultrasoundunwrapped at gmail. Um, I'm gonna have this information on every slide. So if you don't write down my email address now, you'll have plenty of opportunity through every slide um, to jot that down if you want it. Um, this is my website, ultrasoundunwrapped.com. Um, I've got information for expectant parents as well as students there, um, social media, Insta and Facebook, um, same name. And then this guy is my first book um, that I wrote, it took about five years to write. I published it about a year and a half ago. Ultrasound Unwrapped, a week by week pregnancy image guide is um, just basically a resource for expectant parents. I found in all of my years that um, patients really didn't know what to expect from ultrasound. And, and so when I um, left, uh, when I left clinical work, I was trying to figure out what to do with all of this information. So um, I put it in a book and um, yeah, so it's a basically just a basic pregnancy reference, just kind of skimming the service of ultrasound for expectant parents. Um, let's see, okay, so, well, before I go, before I go to the second, um, the second screen. So I started off, and I'll just tell you a little bit about me. I started off in, um, in the hospital setting for about 10 years. Then I went into uh, private practice and specialized in obstetric and gynecological ultrasound um, for 15 years after that. So I was really able to uh, hone that my skills in OB-GYN um, once I went into private practice. Um, all right, so second, move on to the second one here. So basically I'm just gonna talk to you um, a little bit about, I, I don't know where you all are. Maybe you are already ultrasound students or prospective students um, and you're considering 
whether ultrasound is right for you. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, you know, the career jobs and, um, and what that looks like. So most of you probably already know what ultrasound is. Um, basically, very basic, the use of um, sound waves to image certain parts of the body to uh, look for pathology. Um, what do we do? What parts of the body do we look at? So um, these are all areas of focus for ultrasound on the human body. Um, abdominal ultrasound, uh, kidney, liver, um, pancreas, spleen, aorta. Um, we're looking for, you know, masses, cysts, gallbladder, um, stones. Small parts would be like the thyroid and testicles. Um, breast ultrasound, most people are familiar with that examination as an adjunct to mammography. Um, either a patient has a palpable mass that needs further characterization or um, uh, something is seen on mammography and uh, they want to better characterize the area um, to see if it's cystic or solid and so forth with uh, breast ultrasound. Um, this is me, general ob -GYN. Um, obstetrics and gynecology always go together. Um, if I saw an abnormality, that patient would then go to perinatal ultrasound. Um, that patient would go to MFM, would see a perinatologist, have a level two ultrasound. Those sonographers also need to be well-versed in fetal echo or ultrasound of the heart. Um, then there's adult echo. Um, most sonographers who do adult echo only do uh, adult echo. Uh, MSK is a new one for me. It's not new to the field, but came in long after <laughs> I went through ultrasound training. So um, maybe 10 years after I uh, graduated from my program. Uh, but this is uh, musculoskeletal ultrasound, ligaments, tendons, nerves. Um, neonatal heads and pediatric ultrasound. Um, so neonatal heads, you would um, see this in a large hospital with a NICU. Premature babies tend to develop brain bleeds and those need to be monitored and usually with ultrasound. Um, uh, and also uh, pediatric studies, um, usually you see in large hospitals or children's hospitals. Uh, carotids, the, um, the study of the arteries that lead to the brain. Um, peripheral vascular is uh, the study of arteries and veins in the arms and legs. And so here you're evaluating for blood flow and stenosis. Um, moving on. So um, what types of jobs do we have an ultrasound? Where, where do we work? Um, so the hospital, of course. Um, any hospital has a radiology and an ultrasound department. Um, here you're gonna be working with obviously inpatient, outpatient, and emergency room patients. And um, it's in my opinion that you get the best all around uh, experience in a hospital in the radiology department. You know, you're kind of exposed to a lot of different applications of ultrasound. Um, outpatient imaging centers, uh, of course, these are just outpatients and you usually work um, for a radiologist. Um, private practice, you see this mostly with OB-GYN, but there are some other specialties who offer in-house ultrasound. Um, maternal and fetal medicine, again, this can be in a hospital or a private practice. In uh, fertility clinics, this is a whole universe of ultrasound before a patient ever gets pregnant. Um, and again, this can be within a hospital or a private practice. Um, you also, after some experience and um, being certified, of course, you have the option to teach. Um, these jobs are few and far between, but they're there. Usually you have to have a bachelor's degree and a good deal of experience first, obviously. Um, surgical, some sonographers find themselves in surgical suites uh, for the brain or um, gastric imaging, um, applications and sales. This is, um, this is a, a field of ultrasound 
where you don't work for a provider, but you work for the ultrasound equipment manufacturers. So, you know, three of the big ones would be um, Siemens, Philips, or GE. Uh, so you work for those companies. They need people um, and applications to, well, in sales, of course, to sell their equipment, and then in applications to join the sales force um, and teach their clients how to use the equipment they just purchased. Um, admin and management, of course, if you want to um, get into leadership or supervisory positions. Moving on, ultrasound pay. Um, so this grossly varies um, around the country, depending on how rural an area you live in um, or, you know, big city. Um, I had to do a little bit of research here. And, you know, so when you first come out of school, first step out of the classroom, um, this was the figure I was given. And I thought that seems pretty low. I guess it's possible if you're in a, an extremely rural area. Um, someone who's a DMS or a diagnostic medical sonographer before you're registered um, might make, I would say, 25 to 35, maybe 40 if you're in a bigger city. Certainly more, you'll be moving up the pay scale once you're registered. We'll talk about registry uh, status in just a minute. Um, but I think most sonographers find themselves in this bubble, the 50 to 80K range with maybe, say, 10 to 20 or so years of experience. Um, this is probably a good, um, a good estimate. Um, applications does make more. I've seen most applications jobs, um, those sonographers make somewhere in the 90s. And um, this is a pretty demanding job. Um, all of the ads I've seen for applications jobs, you're really going to be traveling. Um, it usually calls for about at least 75% of travel. So maybe three out of five days of the week, you're going to be either um, in a car or flying, covering a tri or even quad state area. So that's a bit demanding. Um, sales, I never, um, I was never in sales. I've seen one reference to this figure, um, but I would say probably anywhere 130 to 150 would probably be good, um, a good estimation for sales because um, you usually they want someone with um, a bachelor's degree, but then um, you also need to have um, a proven track record in, uh, with sales experience. And then you're also getting commissions on the equipment that you sell. Um, and the equipment is pretty expensive. You know, they're half a million to um, a million or so, um, especially if you're selling big units to hospitals and they're buying more than one. Um, okay, so on to the next one. So you've done a little research and you decided, yes, ultrasound is for me. Where, where do I go to school? So I get this question a lot. This is the best resource I can give you. Um, CAAHEP.org. They are a commission on accreditation. Um, the site is super easy to use. Um, you go to a drop down box, you enter in the level of education you're interested in, whether it's a two year, four year program. Um, I think there are even maybe two universities that offer a master's. Um, and then you plug in the state that you want and it just populates all of the schools in that state, which are accredited through CAAHEP. And the reason you wanna look for this is that not all ultrasound programs are created equal. Um, there are so many ultrasound um, education programs now in the US unbelievable compared to 30 years ago when I trained. And um, so CAA HEP really just um, kind of guarantees you that you're, you are entering into a really well-rounded program. Um, you're getting all of the basic uh, class time, uh, book knowledge that you need, um, and then also uh, uh, clinical experience is a really big one for ultrasound. 
you, um, you really need to have um, a lot of hands-on practice with ultrasound. No one ever learned ultrasound by just reading a book. Um, you have to get hands-on experience. So clinical rotations and scanning labs are a really big part, should be a really big part of your education in ultrasound. Um, one thing I've been asked also before is, okay, I'm already enrolled in a program and they are, um, it is not accredited by CAA, HEP, um, by this organization. Does that spell doom and gloom for my career? No, um, no, it doesn't. But as I said before, you just have to make sure that you're getting a all the scan, um, the scan time that you can possibly get. Um, some programs don't offer very much of that. And, and then you kind of find yourself a little bit lost when, when you graduate. So, and this is why um, I think it's so great that it's, uh, that training is offered um, at the university level. Uh, now it has been for several years. It just wasn't when I trained. Um, so you do have two years or four years that you can dedicate to um, your learning so that whenever you get out, um, when, once you graduate and you get into a real, real world situation with a real patient in front of you, um, you're a lot more confident about your skills. Um, so go to that site and look around. Uh, moving on, certification. So ARDMS.org is the national um, certification uh, organization for all sonographers. Um, we are very familiar with the American Registry for Diagnostic Medical Sonography. They give us our examinations, they certify us, um, and they also provide volunteer opportunities. And they also have, um, they also list job opportunities on their site as well. So if you're thinking about being um, a sonographer, you're in school, uh, go to their website and check it out. And so next we'll talk about ultrasound registry examinations. So what are the types of exams, um, registry exams that ARDMS offers? Well, to be credentialed in ultrasound, you have four choices. Um, and really they, the best advice I can give you is to try to register in whatever you're doing the most. So you've graduated from your program, you've just started um, working, um, you're doing a lot of abdominal ultrasound for it. Let's just use that for example. Um, and that's what you wanna take your first exam in. This is what you wanna be registered in. You're gonna pursue our DMS, which is Registered Diagnostic Medical Sonographer. That's me. Um, there's also our DCS, um, Diagnostic Cardiac Sonographer, uh, Registered Vascular te Technologist, um, and then RMSKS, Registered Musculoskeletal Sonographer. So going back to our DMS, so uh, you want to take your abdominal registry. So what you would have to do is sign up for the abdominal registry and, I really should take that comma out at the end and put an and sign, and the SPI examination, which is the sonography principles and instrumentation. So it's a physics test, ultrasound physics, which will definitely, should definitely be part of your curriculum. Um, ultrasound physics and instrumentation, so the equipment as well. Um, this test is very difficult <laughs> to pass, but once you pass it, um, you never have to take it again as long as you keep up with your continuing medical education credits, and we'll talk about that next. So you have to pass both the specialty and the physics test. Um, if you fail, if you pass one and not the other, you can retake the other and uh, three months, and then you have five years to pass both of them. Um, so if you don't pass it a second time, you have five years to pass both. Once you pass both, you have earned the credentials of RDMS. Then let's say the next year you find yourself doing a lot of OB-GYN um, and you want to become registered in that as well. You can go back then and take the OB-GYN examination and you do not have to take the physics test again, unless you decide, oh, I wanna be registered in adult echo. 
Um, so then you have to take the adult echo test and it's coordinating um, sonography principles and instrumentation examination. And then um, each one you'll see RBT and MSKS um, both have their own um, SPI examinations. And ARDMS dues. So they just went up on this again. Um, so it's $95 a year now. You have to maintain uh, 30 CMEs or continuing medical education credits every three years. They call it a triennium. So um, you, uh, there are a couple of ways to do that. So these are two of the biggest professional organizations for sonographers, AIUM and SDMS. Um, here are their, both of their websites. Um, I encourage you to, to go take a look. Um, so AIUM is like $155 a year, and it also gives you the JUM, which is the Journal of Ultrasound and Medicine. So it's their monthly um, magazine that they put out with all kinds of um, articles. And then it includes like four CME tests in every one. So, um, and, and they're only worth like one CME each, but you don't have to pay anything extra for them. So you just go on their website and take the test. And, um, and then you submit that to your ARDMS bank. And um, at the end of your triennium, usually they will audit you and make sure that you, um, that you have submitted all of your CMEs. So you must do this um, and, and they will check. And if you don't, um, you, so your, your dues are due by December 31st, midnight every year. And, um, and if you don't complete that and your CMEs, then uh, you will no longer be on active registry status and you will have to retake your examinations. Yep. You don't want to have to do that. <laughs> and if you maintain all of those, you won't have to, um, you won't ever have to take another physics exam again. So as far as I know. All right, so this next one, um, I just thought I would show you um, a few interesting images about the growth and de development of an embryo to a fetus in the first trimester. And th these are some of the images I include in my book. Um, it's just, uh, just interesting to see the transformation in just a few short weeks. So we'll start with the upper left, and this is a six-week embryo. This is the earliest we can usually identify an embryo and uh, cardiac activity. So um, if you look up at the top, so this is where the probe would be, right? So this is the anterior or mom's belly. Um, down at the bottom, of the image, this would be mom's back. So this is anterior, this is posterior, just to give you a little orientation. But here's the uterus. Now this is a pregnancy, you notice two gestational sacs here. This is a twin pregnancy, this is baby A. We don't really see baby A in that particular image because we're focused on baby B. So this is the gestational sac for B. Um, you can see little calibers here. This is the crown rump length or from the head to the butt, although we can't really discern which is head and rear on, um, on a six week embryo because they're only three and a half millimeters. Um, if this was a real time and not a frozen image, you would see a flicker of a heartbeat, um, usually about hundred beats a minute or so that early. And, um, and then this is the yolk sac no yolk sac, no heartbeat. Um, week seven, so baby is about doubled in size. Again, crown rump, crown rump. Um, this is the yolk sac. Week eight, so in just another week, you're, al you're already starting to see a little bit better formation of the body. So there's the head. Um, this would be the heart. These are tiny little arm buds right there. Um, this echo here, this white line in this one, you just see a little bit of the amniotic membrane. It's very thin that just actually goes around the, the embryo here. Head rump measurement, babies um, about, not quite an inch. Week nine, uh, so nine and a half weeks is this baby. You can see how much uh, bigger it is, just about, uh, about an inch or so. The head here, a little bit of brain development 
little arm buds, leg buds. And I've got a video I'll show you at the end of um, um, how busy this little guy is. They get quite active at nine weeks. Um, week 10, so this is a side profile of this fetus. So now baby's a fetus and not an embryo. So the face would be on this side, uh, abdomen, this is a little bit of the umbilical cord. And again, the, this is the crown rump measurement. Um, baby's about an inch and a half now. Um, 11 weeks, one day is the next one. Baby's about 43 millimeters in this image. And baby's almost fully developed as far as arms and legs go. You can even see a little eye there. This is not a side view of the face. It's kind of more facing us. Um, week 12, the next one, this is a great, um, week 12 and 13, really, really great profile views of these, um, of this fetus. Forehead here, you can see a little bit of the tip of the nose. You can even identify the lips there just a little bit and the chin. It's a little bit of a hand, some of the cord, foot here. Um, again, crown rump there. This baby is 12 weeks, one day and about five and a half centimeters. And then uh, week 13, this is a beautiful profile shot of this fetus. Forehead is all very well delineated. Let's see if I can mag it up a little. So you can see the forehead here, nasal bone, tip of the nose. You can see the top and lower bottom of the lip, the chin. You can see the mandible here, hand. Um, so the neck down to the abdomen, this is the lower leg a little bit here. And this baby is um, about three inches or maybe a little less. Okay. So the next one is, um, I'll give you a little case study here. So this, um, this sort of emphasizes the importance, um, the important role ultrasound plays in obstetrics. Um, one of the things we look for, or um, when, when we're scanning, anytime we're scanning fetus, we're looking for um, anything abnormal, right? Well, the only way to know whether something is abnormal is to know normal. So you'll probably scan um, you know, 25, you can scan 25 fetuses at 12 weeks um, that are all normal. And then when you scan that next baby with an abnormality, you'll pick it up right away. So it's very important in ultrasound to know what normal looks like first in any aspect, not just OB. But in any application of ultrasound, you have to know what normal is first before you can identify what's abnormal. So one of the things we look for in a 12 week fetus is if you see this dark line here, this is called the nugal translucency. Um, anything black on ultrasound is fluid and this happens to be a little um, cerebrospinal fluid back here. So if this is mom's belly and back here is posterior, this is what we call an AP dimension. So we would measure this thickness and it would be about a millimeter. And that is completely normal and we would expect to see that. So if you move to the next uh, baby over to the right hand side of the screen. So this baby is about the same gestational age and we don't have a great profile view like we do in the other one. This is sort of the back of baby's head, kind of imagine the baby looking away from us. And this is, um, so this is, the abdomen here, this is the bottom, um, baby's rear, and then um, you catch a little bit of the spine, come, but you can imagine the spine coming around like this. So um, where the image on the left, the nuchal translucency is about a millimeter and normal, over here, what do we see? How thick is this? So this should be something that is pretty apparent that sticks right out at you. 
that tells you immediately that there's something either genetically abnormal or structurally abnormal about this fetus. And you may not be able to tell exactly what that is because structures um, on a 12 or 13 week fetus are very tiny um, and it may not be apparent immediately, but this is certainly apparent. Um, you can see the fluid starting to collect, um, the edema collecting uh, right there between the skin and the skull, and um, it comes around and just engulfs the baby's entire body. So there's just a failure of the lymphatic system here. Um, so typically what happens is the sonographer takes this measurement, um, presents it to either the reading radiologist or the, um, the ordering physician. For me, it would have been the ordering physician because I work directly with the obstetricians. Um, he or she would then talk to his or her patient and let them know about the results. Um, then the patient would be referred to maternal fetal medicine for a level two ultrasound. They would see the perinatologist or high risk OB doctor. Um, and then he or she would speak to the parents about um, next options, which are usually, do you wanna do genetic testing to determine the cause of this? Most of the time that's yes. Um, it used to be that that diagnosis had to be made via um, uh, an amniocentesis. That doesn't have to be done anymore um, uh, for, or at least I think, there might still be a couple of situations where they have to do it. I think sometimes in the case of maybe twins, they still have to do an amnio. But, um, but otherwise, for the vast majority of cases, it's a blood test with harmony or panorama. Um, and if the father is available, saliva from the father, it's sent off to a lab, comes back in like 10 days to two weeks, um, giving the results that, um, about whether there's uh, any cordy involved. Um, so what we're looking for is either an abnormal karyotype, um, if it comes back, you know, for like uh, uh, trisomies, so like Down syndrome or Turner syndrome, to explain what's going on here. Um, if the karyotype is normal, then we can guess that there's probably something structural going on, and. and an example I can give you is uh, for someone who had this issue, it was determined at 10 weeks, um, we could see this fluid collection. We ended up scanning um, her at 14 weeks and determined that baby had about one and a half chambers of the heart versus four. Um, and so that's what was going on in you know, the carrot. She had genetic testing done. The, um, uh, uh, baby was genetically normal, um, but the heart was not. And it was a really, it turned out to be a really rare um, uh, structural malformation of the heart. Um, so the, the reason ultrasound was good here was that um, A, early detection, um, early management, patient education for what to expect. And then babies like hers, um, could not be, uh, could not deliver locally. She actually had to um, relocate to another state and, and deliver her baby in um, a major hospital, um, you know, one with um, a neonatal cardiac surgeon and its staff to, um, you know, to take care of this child and give the baby the care it, need, it needed so that um, just in case he needed surgery at birth, which he did. Um, and, you know, uh, 40 years ago before ultrasound, uh, 50, 60 years ago, um, babies like hers would have died. Um, you know, before we could see things like this, before ultrasound came along, um, we wouldn't know about these sort of abnormalities. She would have delivered locally and um, baby probably would not have uh, made it on a life flight to another hospital. So this is the importance of ultrasound and obstetrics. And, um, you know, we're probably the only people on earth that say uh, uh, pathology is really cool. It's not cool, but it's certainly a learning tool for sonographers. 
Um, okay, and so last thing, let me see if I can, I'm gonna try to pull up this video. I don't know, can you see this video? On my side, no, I just see your contact or name and ask me anything. Okay, um, since we had an issue with, with that, we'll see, it's on my... Is it a YouTube link? Thing. What's that? Is it a YouTube link that you'd be able to kind of share on a separate? No, no? no. See, I thought it was gonna show my whole desktop. So, um, And it's not, it's only showing the one. Oh well, I don't know how to do it. Um, so yeah, it's not showing my whole desktop. It's only showing my PDF. No. Um, okay, well, if anybody's interested, I can, um, you can certainly email me and I can <laughs> try to upload the video and see if you can see it that way. Um, anyway, so let me move on from here. Um, so I will say that ultrasound was probably the most difficult and technically challenging thing I've ever learned in my entire life. Um, but I don't think that should dissuade anyone from uh, pursuing ultrasound as a career. Um, I will say you have more opportunities for education than I ever had. And um, I think that's a big factor. Uh, when, when I went into ultrasound, I was, um, I was first introduced uh, with the um, when I was expecting my first child. And, um, and so I just kind of, I thought it was very interesting. I was always interested in, in science and biology and how the human body functions. Um, so I just jumped in both feet first, not knowing anything else about ultrasound. And um, so I had absolutely zero background in healthcare. Uh, whatsoever. I knew nothing. Um, and so, you know, learning about um, the, the whole modality, anatomy and physiology, learning ultrasound, what it looks like on the monitor, and then learning to reproduce it, um, how labs and other correlative uh, radiologic examinations um, play, tie in with ultrasound. Um, it was just all very overwhelming. And so I really struggled, I think, the first um, few months that I was uh, out of school and working. But, um, you know, uh, ultrasound is a skill that's honed over, over time. And um, I encourage anyone to, um, to do it if you think you're interested. Um, so people, you know, ask, how do I know if ultrasound is for me? Um, I say, if you like to work with people, um, that, you know, of course that can be difficult. Um, that can be true of any field working with the general public, but just know that you are scanning someone um, and you're looking for um, problems and occasionally and often you find them. And, and when you do, you really have to be able to show empathy. I think it's so super important in any healthcare field. Um, you have patients who are miscarrying, um, a patient who doesn't have a fetal heartbeat um, anymore, um, patients with uh, a poor OB history or recurrent miscarriage, people who, um, people who can't get pregnant, um, and other facets of ultrasound, you know, you have uh, cancer survivors who are there for their, you know, annual screenings again, or they have a family member who's had cancer and just died. You know, it's, um, you have to, I don't, I don't believe in healthcare providers being stoic, um, and in straight face. I think that you have to uh, come up with a dialogue that works for you, but you have to be able to relate to your patient and show your patient comfort in that moment. Um, you also have to be extraordinarily um, 
keen on attention to detail. <laughs> you really have to uh, like that. If you're just a big picture person and you can't stand details, ultrasound may not be for you. Um, and then the last thing is uh, blood and body fluids. Yes, even in OB, we deal with blood and body fluids um, every day, uh, if not every day, every week, certainly. And some people are surprised to hear that because they think it's just scanning on the belly. Um, no, we do an extraordinary amount of vaginal ultrasound. Um, and so those patients are, um, uh, again, they're bleeding. We're trying to find the, the problem for the bleeding, whether they're pregnant or not pregnant. Um, and people are miscarrying and, you know, we, we scan them during those times too. So um, yeah, that's it. Um, oh, one other thing I was gonna say, was if you have any ultrasound students listening who are interested in obstetrical ultrasound, um, I cannot offer a discount on my paperback um, because the distributor doesn't allow me to do that for anyone, but, um, but I can on my ebook. So um, I've had sonographers read my book and say that and they've bought it for their, um, their new uh, sonographers who are, you know, really just getting familiar with, uh, with OB. And um, so I can offer you a 30% discount. It's normally like $9.99. So um, I can give you, um, you know, a couple of dollars off of that. So if you're interested, write down my email address, um, give me a shout, let me know, and I can get that set up for you. All right. Well, okay. first of all, thank you so much, Sandra, for all of that information. We're really, really sure. happy to, to have um, a field like this presented the first time that we had it so far on shadowing. And I think we have over 40 sessions going for ourselves right now. So Great. very, very excited to, to have gone through this. We do have a few questions and we just wanted to start out uh, by asking from what you've seen personally, anecdotally, have there been any ob gyn physicians or MFM physicians that actually have an RDMS credential themselves? Is it, is it something that's outside of their training? Have they added it to their training? Um, or is it something that they already cover in residency? Um, it's not, it's, it's something that they get a little bit of, I will say, um, they, they get just, um, a little, um, like an introduction to ultrasound and, and that's about it. Now there are some, um, physicians who are sonologists, and um, that's the label for a physician who does ultrasound. And there, there are um, tests, there are registry examinations through ARDMS for physicians who want that, um, who want that credential. Um, some really take a fascination to ultrasound, and they like to do a lot of scanning themselves. And so, yeah, they have that option. Um, I will say that. I almost, I almost took a job with advanced reproductive medicine when I was living in Colorado. And um, part of that job, what was gonna be really cool about it was um, the, the uh, maternal fetal medicine fellows um, did a rotation through that clinic and I would have been the one to train them on ultrasound. So I think it depends on, um, what you, what your specialty calls for, and certainly um, maternal fetal medicine physicians and um, and uh, you know fertility fellows really need to have a much more hands on experience, um, much more of a, a scanning knowledge base for ultrasound. And you touched a little on when that takes place. Like for example, um, for MFM fellows, they have a rotation just as an example. Is it possible or have you seen um, a pre-med or pre-PA student in undergrad take on that? Is there a realistic commitment for them um, to take on a sonography program, become uh, registered and, and get some practice going for themselves over a few gap years before transitioning into medical or PA school? Um, I don't, I'm not familiar with if they're, um, I don't know that, um, that physicians, um, opt, opt for that. Um, I know that in general education or in, while they're in med school, 
um, like for example, the uh, the practice, the ob practice where I worked would have uh, routinely um, physicians in med school or uh, um, students in med school come through and um, do a rotation in ob while they're trying to figure out, you know, which specialty they're going to, um, they're going to uh, go for. Um, but they just kind of, you know, shadowed us and kind of watched our examinations and we would explain to them. Um, I will say, I, I do think that they're, depending on the program you go through, um, I did see, I have seen before a couple of, um, uh, educational programs for ultrasound for physicians. So I don't know, I don't know that it's something that, that med students would want to take on because they're so inundated as it is, um, you know, with their own curriculum. So I don't know that anybody would want to necessarily take on, you know, an, an additional ultrasound course, but, um, but I do believe they're there. I know that they're there for, um, like, um, you know, uh, nurse practitioners and physicians and sort of like a more of a condensed course that I think they can take it any time that, that they wish. Also, uh, for you, you mentioned there's a couple of registry exams, a couple specialties within those, um, ob being one of them and the one that you mainly practice in. Why was it specifically ob that was most enticing for you? Um, well, I'm registered in abdomen and ob -GYN, and it just happened to be what I was doing the most of, I guess. Um, in the first 10 years in the hospital setting, I was really, um, there were lots of different applications that I worked on. So um, I did um, abdomen, small parts, ob -GYN. Um, I did do vascular and carotid Doppler studies. I even did some um, ophthalmic studies of the eye. I'm not sure that that's done much anymore. Um, but um, I just kind of gravitated to abdomen. I took that first and um, passed it, barely passed physics, but I did it. <laughs> and, um, and then I think three years later, I went back uh, for ob -GYN. Again, it was what I was doing the most of, and it interested me more than vascular at the time. So, um, so I just, I went for ob -GYN. Yeah. And then it yeah. served me well, because then I could um, you know, work in a private practice um, later on. And I will say a lot of students coming right out of school would see what I was doing and they wanted to do that as well. But um, private practice is not the place for someone who's just uh, stepped out of the classroom. Um, you really need a good solid three years of full-time ob -GYN experience and be registered in ob -GYN because a lot of that work is independent. You don't have any supervisors. Um, you don't have one, uh, anyone supervising your work, you're reporting directly to the physicians, um, radiologists are, are not reading your examinations. Um, but I learned more working in ob -GYN, um, in the first two years than I ever learned um, uh, working in the hospital setting for uh, obstetrics and gynecology. So it was a um, pretty great experience. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. I also wanted to ask if you could walk us through what a typical day looks like for you in practice. Um, well, let's see. So um, when I I'll just talk about, I guess, and when I was in private practice, um, you know, every seems every place around every facility around the country seems to practice ultrasound a little differently as far as uh, what they require or how they set up their schedules. Um, for us in private practice, we had three sonographers. Um, two of us focused on ob -GYN. Another one focused on breast ultrasound because we offered mammography services. So I had my own schedule. The other sonographer had her own schedule. Um, we had a patient, either OB or GYN, every uh, 30 minutes. Um, some days would be completely full with, you know, 14 patients um, on the schedule. 
Um, you know, some days we would have gaps or holes depending on, you know, the time of the year. Of course, you know, everybody's deductible is going to start over again in January. So December is usually a really, really busy month for healthcare. Um, and so, um, yeah, the examinations were a range of, you know, um, ultrasound and pregnancy from, uh, you know, four weeks to, um, to 42 weeks. Um, and then GYN patients, which are usually transvaginal studies. We also did procedures way back when before Panorama and Harmony, some of those genetic testing, um, uh, some of that, um, you know, the more easy genetic testing now, the lab work. Um, I assisted on lots of amniocentesis, um, but again, later on, um, um, we would do nuchal translucency um, testing and that the ultrasound portion of the genetic tests. Um, and um, we would do procedures. We did some procedures for gynecology patients called um, sonohysterography, so, um, or saline infusion ultrasound, where the physician would insert a catheter into the uterus and, um, and um, administer sterile saline. And it would, I would also have the vaginal probe inserted and then you would see the endometrium open up and we could tell if there were any um, polyps um, or, fibroids and the lining of the uterus is a pretty interesting procedure. So um, just a variety um, of OB and GYN every 30 minutes. And when, when I was done, I was done and I got to leave and it was, it was pretty sweet. So I didn't, I no longer had call there or worked evenings or weekends or holidays. So <laughs> yeah. It was like the best clinical job you could ever have. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. That, that's nice on the schedule. Right. I also, I also wanted to ask. You mentioned earlier that um, you're able to kind of guide mentees and students. Um, being in your position now, are there any experiences that you can call upon that continue to inspire you as you progress, going on thirty years now? Um, with with students per se, or with patients, or just in yeah. general. With students one. specifically? With students. Um, I guess probably the most inspiring thing for me is um, that I, I really enjoy helping students in, in any area that will help them, um, um, that will give them a leg up. Just because I know how difficult of a time I had when I first came out of, of training. Um, it was a relatively short program, again, with no history, with no background at all in healthcare. Um, it was really very challenging. So, um, you know, I try to answer any questions I can. And, um, and so, you know, any, any students who have any questions or prospective students, any questions at all about ultrasound, um, feel free to email me. Can't promise I know everything, but I'm happy to um, you know, help you figure out whatever it is you need to know. That's great. You also mentioned that you got together your book and, and you touched about just how you were able to call upon your training, right? And, and gather some pretty essential info into that book. What was the process like, the timeline of creating your own book? Um, it was very, very difficult. I say that it's the, it was the second hardest thing that I've ever learned. Um, the hardest thing next to ultrasound is very technically uh, challenging. I was, I think I probably wasn't using the right program, but I have a Mac. And so um, it, uh, I started writing it in pages. And so I came across all kinds of technical hurdles with regard to formatting and that sort of thing. The information in the book um, wasn't that hard for me because um, it's what I did for 25 years. So I could call on, um, on my experience. And then I had so many images that, that I could include, but it was really technical hurdles um, with regard to formatting and then the whole publishing process. Um, um, again, it, it took me about five years um, to write and publish. Uh, I will say that, and I did have a professional editor um, who actually was a friend, and um, 
you have to have an editor. Nobody should ever publish anything without an editor. Um, but she was a saving grace because, you know, my specialty was in healthcare. It, it was not in writing. And so even though I have a pretty decent mastery of the English language, as far as writing is concerned, um, there are all kinds of um, editing and publishing Bible that I was not familiar with. And, and so she could really coach and guide me and set, you know, um, with regard to those technicalities. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, it was a process. <laughs> Definitely. I'm sure it is. Another question about specialties. So could you walk us through to what, you know, the difficulty, comparative difficulty from ob to adult echo or fetal echo, um, the ones that you're talking about through the registry exams, are there levels of difficulty that you've seen differences, comparisons that you can make? Um, I would say probably, probably abdominal ultrasound is probably one of the easiest. And I think a lot of people, um, unless they, um, unless they start out in a different field, you know, everybody kind of does something different. So, you know, when you're going through an ultrasound program, you learn more than just one thing. You learn more than just one application. It's not just OBGYN. Hopefully you're going to a program that's gonna teach you a number of modalities, right? And so as you're going through the educational process, you know, you're just, just like, um, you know, students in med school. Um, you know, they're kind of, you know, you might start med school thinking, oh, I really want to go into OB-GYN. And then after you go through clinical rotations, it's like, oh, I, I'm really drawn to internal medicine, you know, because maybe you had a specific, um, you know, mentor in that clinical rotation that really spoke to you. And so I, I think ultrasound is kind of the same way. Um, you, you get into your clinical rotations and you find, you know, you decide, oh, ob is for me. I love scanning a fetus. I love, you know, that connection with, you know, new parents. Um, or, you know, a lot of guys typically don't go into ob um, because it is a lot of, you know, one-on-one -on -one patient care, a lot of like transvaginal ultrasound. If a guy is doing that, most women are not comfortable with that. So, you know, they've got to have, um, um, regardless of whether they're comfortable or not, they usually have to have a chaperone. So you usually find women mostly gearing, you know, going the ob route. Um, there are a lot of men who usually go the um, adult echo route and uh, vascular, uh, vascular route. And it's just really depends on what, um, you know, what you like and what speaks to you. Um, as far as registries go, like I said, I think abdom the abdominal registry is probably the easiest. Um, I think vascular and um, I take it back. I think echo is the hardest. <laughs> um, I never was really very interested in echo, but usually people who want to focus in adult echo only do adult echo and they have very specialized training for just the adult heart. Um, um, uh, if you want to get into, um, uh, perinatology ultrasound or, you know, MFM, the level two ultrasound is the high risk OB. Um, that is quite difficult. OB is a challenge in and of itself because usually ultrasound is oriented to the patient, right? Um, but when you're scanning a fetus, then everything is oriented to that fetus. And you've got, um, you know, a whole different orientation and then a very active moving target that, um, that you're trying to scan. So that presents its own challenges as well. Um, and I thought vascular, um, especially carotid Doppler, I thought was very interesting. So you're looking at the hemodynamics of flow and blood vessels, and some people are really drawn to that. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, I think the physics, um, the principle, the sonography principles and instrumentation examination is very difficult, no matter what specialty you want to get credentialed in. Um, but, um, but yeah, you know, whatever, whatever people find themselves um, 
um, most interested in while they're in school are usually the jobs that they look for when they get out. If you find yourself in a hospital and you're doing a number of different modalities, um, it's, that's gonna give you a good, uh, well-rounded sort of introduction to ultrasound. And then, you know, on a daily basis when you're practicing, um, when you're practicing ultrasound in, in real life with real life patients on your table, you can decide, you know, what you, you, you know, after a while, what you really like the best, um, what you really like doing the most. And then that's, that's the registry that you're gonna wanna take. One more question. Did I to your question. Yeah, yeah, it did. Um, and okay. I mean, it, it definitely helps to have context. Like you, you were going through the context behind each of these specialties. Like for example, with adult echo, they only do that, right? Makes sense Usually. for that. That, and depending on the, sometimes you work in a vascular lab where they do adult echo and vascular. So mm -hmm. sometimes those two go together. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. I think we'll wrap it up with one more question. Okay. And Question is going to be um, in terms of the advances in technology for ultrasound, what you see in the future. Are there any that we see um, that are up and coming, um, or have there any have there been any recent changes in the in the past year or so, the past two years um, that you've seen in practice? Well, I have not been in clinical practice. I've been more in education for the past six years. So I know um, what I can say that I do know with, um, you know, with what I've seen and then also friends of mine who are stenographers who are still in the field is, um, um, especially as far as OB goes, is um, just a continued every year they, they tend to tweak software just a little bit so that resolution gets better and better and better. Um, the resolution today compared to 30 years ago is unbelievable. Um, I mean, you see, you've seen just the, I mean, I can equate it to uh, like a television, for example, you know, televisions uh, 50 years ago were, you know, unbelievably frosty and you had your antennas or whatever, um, you know, compared to the, you know, HD screens today, the televisions today are, are incredible. And so I really can relate the resolution um, for ultrasound in just that way. And so as the resolution gets better, we see more and more things, right? And so as we see, um, as we're able to identify more, um, more anatomy, or maybe it's pathology, then we have the education starts all over again. So then we have to um, ask ourselves, is that normal? Could, or, or is that pathology? And we don't really know, time will tell, because it could just be, are we seeing it now because resolution is so good? Has it always been there and we just couldn't see it before? Um, so I know the resolution with 3D ultrasound um, has really become phenomenal. Um, it's not just uh, a sepia tone or a blue tone. Um, they've applied pink tones to, um, to the fetus in 3D and 4D so that it really looks like the skin of a baby. Um, and so I, you know, I know that's, um, uh, that, that's what I know of the most. The other applications I wouldn't know because I haven't done them in 15 years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's some, some good insight there. Um, we'll wrap up today's session and I'll just shout out a few quick reminders to those who are listening in. So to our shadowers, to earn credit for your attendance, we have a quiz. That quiz is comprised of 10 questions. You have to answer six or more of those questions correctly or 60% or higher um, to receive a certificate. And to access that quiz, it's available either through our chat box, we've posted in the same chat box that you have the questions, or um, you can look onto our website under the virtual shouting page. Just scroll a bit down. This is gonna be a Thursday quiz. So on the left, on the right-hand side, we have our Thursday quiz. Click onto that, should say Sandra on it. Um, and I, it's gonna be due next week on Wednesday, October 19th at 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, again, after passing that quiz, you'll receive credit. That credit will come in the form of um, your certificate, which is documentation of um, you having attended this session. That certificate will be sent to the email that you list 
on the quiz, we recommend that you list a personal email, like a Gmail or Yahoo account. And if you don't find it in your inbox, please check your spam folder. Although if you don't find it in either, feel free to shoot us an email and we can help retrieve it for you. Next week, we will have Dr. Rana. She's a oncologist from Toronto. Um, so we'll be seeing her. I think this is gonna be one of our first oncology sessions um, from my memory. We're gonna be seeing her at 7 p.m. Central as usual on Monday, October 17th. Again, we usually go through Monday and Thursday um, as our, our typical session date. So um, definitely stay tuned for that. That's gonna be next week again, 7 p.m. Central, Monday, 7, October 17th. And like always, you can feel free, feel free to follow us on Instagram where we'll be posting more flyers for future sessions. We're gonna be continuing through the end of this year and onto the next. Um, so definitely stay tuned. You can also subscribe to our listserv, again, through our subscription form. I'm at the bottom of any of our web pages or just by emailing us. Um, and also Sandra, she provided her email, her Gmail. So feel free to um, shoot any questions to her through a quick email. I'm sure she'd be happy to respond. Um, and we've also included the link just in case you're interested to her book um, in our description of this video. So if you click under that link, you'll also find our quiz, but I think it either is at below or above our quiz in that same description, you'll find the link to her um, to her book in case you're interested. Uh, but with that said, again, thank you so much, Sandra. We really can't say thank you enough. Um, thank and let's you. see in the chat from everyone listening uh, for Sandra. It's really an honor to, to hear from you with all your experience. Um, and again, it was one of our first times hearing about sonography. We had ob in the past, um, but not necessarily a specific session to this. So it's really been exciting. Awesome. All right, great. So happy to be here. And guys, email me. I'm happy to help you with anything I can. All right. We'll Thank see you, you next week. Hope you all have a great rest of your night.